All right. Hello, everyone. I am Caitlin Stats. Um, I am so happy that everyone could make it today to this audio drama roundtable. This time we are talking about sound design, mixing, and mastering. And we have two presenters today. We have Travis Van Groff and we have Sarah Baczynski. And uh, I've worked with both of them. I work a lot with Travis because he's the fool in Fool and Scholar Productions. And then we've also worked with Sarah on some of our projects, and Sarah also works on some other great projects as part of uh, Polarity Audio Works. So um, we're going to have the two presentations. The way that this works is we will go through both presentations one after the other. If you have questions, please put them in the chat box. That way everything is in order by presentation and everybody's questions can be addressed in order. Uh, once we get to the ends, we will go over those. Once the questions are done, we will open it up to discussion. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Travis, who is going to go first. All right. Uh, I'm going to start a timer to make sure I stay on time here today. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Travis Van Groff, and I've put some time into a fun visual presentation that hopefully you can see. Thumbs up, anybody? Perhaps. Yes, cool. So storytelling with sound, that is the goal today. Um, Sarah is on the more technical side uh, for mixing and mastering and getting into the nitty gritty of the far po end of post-production. I'm sort of into the, the deep of production to post-production. And today we're gonna learn how to create worlds and tell stories uh, with sound, that is the goal. Now you're probably thinking, all right, who is this Travis guy? Why is he here talking about this stuff? What, is his, what are his credentials? So I am a, uh, I'm a storyteller. I played Dungeons and Dragons since I was eight. Uh, I've always been telling stories, making up stories, telling real ones on the internet and, and beyond and in person. I'm a musician of eight plus albums. Uh, I've recorded a lot of different ones with bands by myself as well. I'm an entertainer of, of 10 plus years, probably more, doing live shows, uh, puppet shows, like you probably see in the pictures. Um, having a lot of fun live all the time and also uh, over the internet. And I've, I've had some education, none of which pertains directly to sound design. Um, I went to the New York Film Academy for acting. Again, not really anything to do with anything. I went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh for game design. I went to the University of South Florida for business management, which sort of kind of has ties into production and organizing things. And the Allegro Music Academy, which taught me how to play instruments, but not really how to record any of them. Um, all of my experience is a school of hard knocks, doing it live, fixing it in post, that sort of stuff. I worked on short films uh, in high school. They were a lot of fun. Some had, they're called small budgets, but they're the biggest numbers of any production I've ever worked with. I got into music because music was a lot of fun and recording. And then I started incorporating sounds of places I went to uh, using a little handy cam that you see, uh, it's a, a Zoom. And I incorporated those sounds into my music because I thought it would help set, uh, evoke a feeling in the music. And then I went to like making a story album and then found my way to audio drama because it's people telling the story uh, instead of trying to tell a story through music. From my perspective, I've always believed that uh, you, you can learn things, you can go to school for things. Not all of us have the ability or the, uh, the financial wherewithal to do so. So you can learn these things through the internet or just practice and experimentation. And that regardless of how good you ever get, you can always still be learning and improving. And that skill is a function of practicing and experimentation. So that's, that's the crux of my belief and kind of uh, some of the stuff you'll be hearing in this presentation repeated a bunch of times. So again, I, I don't have a formal education, but I have a lot of experience um, working on shows like Dark Dice, The Boar Knight, Vast Horizon, The White Vault, and Liberty. Some of these have gotten uh, millions of downloads, some of them not nearly as much, uh, and many other small other one-off stories that you probably haven't heard. So I, I, I make a story every two weeks, and I'm putting in probably 20 plus hours a week into editing and sound design. So that's, that's my experience, and I'm hoping to share some of that with you. My presentation has uh, four, four big goals here. One, using your setting as a character and making your settings more evocative, a part of your story as opposed to being the incidental setting, the empty room that your plot takes place in or the, the plain field where nothing takes place except dialogue and the interactivity there. Next is the grand illusion, combining voices, sounds, uh, either those you're recording or those you're finding on the internet and making them all sound like they're in the same space. 
which is uh, important and key in creating the grand illusion that is audio drama and the fictional story that you're trying to tell. Also, I'm gonna go with creating sounds with depth. That is to say, three-dimensional, not in a spatial sense, but sounds that you feel aren't just ones that you found and recorded on a laptop and you're playing through a laptop speaker while people are fictionally fighting in your fictional story, but how do you get those really good sounds? Uh, whether or not you're making them or you're editing them together. Finally, tips and tricks. If you're working 20 hours a week on something and you can save 10% of your time by doing it easier, that's very important. So I'm gonna go through ways you can save time and work more efficiently. And that's very important as an editor. And a lot of these things I'm gonna go over will also uh, translate for writers to some degree as you're creating your stories. So let's get started. Your setting as a character. What do you hear when you see this picture in your mind's ear? not your mind's eye, but uh, this is a picture of a graveyard for those of you who can't see. Uh, it's, it's in Ireland, I was there, it was, and when you look at this picture, you can hear the wind hitting those, uh, those bushes. You can maybe hear the sounds of a bell in the distance, the sounds of gravel underfoot. It really creates a sense of a location without people saying, oh, we're in a graveyard. As you're creating your stories, we're trying to make settings that have different feelings and that feel auditorily distinct from one another without having to call them out through dialogue, which is sort of a, a weaker storytelling mechanic. This is the forest in Canada, and the, the point of this picture here is uh, think of your setting as a character. You know, the more you develop your settings and your locations, the more memorable they'll be. Weather can make your journey more memorable. If you have a drug deal, if you have uh, battling a dragon, you could do that during the day on a, on a nice sunny day, of course, but if you make it you know, rainy and uh, you put thunder in the background, it, it can really be a lot more memorable sometimes. Or in the case of this picture, maybe you hear some crows in the background. Maybe it's a different kind of wind instead of wind through the bushes. Maybe it's wind through larger trees. And that does sound auditorily distinct. I, I don't need to tell you how it sounds because you can go to these places, not necessarily this one in Canada, but there's probably woods somewhere near you live, where you live. And you can hear the difference of wind going through the trees versus, you know, through a graveyard. If There's probably a graveyard where you live if you live near people. So I, I always stress that you can challenge yourself. You could have people in a featureless blank room, but that's really uh, kind of the not the sound designer, not the creative answer, not a way to make your story more memorable. And as a writer, if you're thinking about your setting as part of the story, as opposed to an incidental location, you can really make for some more memorable scenes, um, visually as well as auditorily, but there's no visually in the audio drama world. So something as simple as this picture, which is a, a field in uh, Bavaria, Germany, you could maybe think of, again, wind is a component. What kind of wind? It's wind through grass and maybe you're thinking of some, some German music in the background, either hurdy-gurdy or accordion, maybe some cows, or a tourist bus stops by and drops off a bunch of uh, tourists from maybe Asia or maybe uh, America who are talking about the area. There are many different components to what you can do, even with the most mundane and boring locations. And that's really what I'm, I'm trying to stress here, because what if my story is indoors, you're thinking, in this generic windowless room, which is as, as in poor quality as the picture I'm using to depict it. And it's intentionally a poor picture because it's, it's this sort of cubicle-y space where people are talking and, and there's no background noise. And that's in a lot of audio dramas that I've, I've listened to recently that are, are out there. And they could be more exciting. So maybe instead of a generic windowless room, maybe we're in a clock tower. Maybe your secret lair is in an underground uh, clock tower or near a festival or it's, it's near an airport, so there's always airplane noises in the background, or maybe it's underwater in a submarine or a place that has a view of underwater and you can kind of play to the aquatic soundscapes. So instead of having conversations in boring locations, you can, you're the writer and it's, it's no extra cost to you as, as the writer or possibly creator or co-creator to change the setting in a way that doesn't truly affect the story, but maybe you've got this cool ticking sound in the background that adds and lends uh, emotion and um, really character, distinction to your, your setting. Now, if you're hell-bent on this dull location, you can always add actions uh, to the location. Again, this is as a writer or as a producer. 
Perhaps your characters are walking through the location from one place to the other, from one side of the room to the other. They're walking from one setting to the other. They're washing dishes if they're in a kitchen. They're maybe on a jog. They're maybe watching television or listening to a radio in the background. As they're getting the phone call from your antagonist, maybe they're cleaning something with a dust buster or a broom. Maybe they're counting money or repairing something. These all have sounds, and the sounds associated with them can be very exciting and fun, and it makes your, your scene more dynamic, even if it's a sort of dull location, which mundane locations do happen in many stories. But you can make it more exciting by adding uh, dynamic action. So that's sort of the setting stuff. Now we're, we're going to combine a lot of elements and try and create this grand illusion that these people who've maybe never met before, maybe were rem recorded remotely, or maybe recorded in a studio, are now in a scene with sound effects because your actors are not going to record their own sound effects. They have microphones for their voices and we're trying to capture the sound of their voice and we're trying to capture vocalizations they'll give, but we don't want to capture slap sounds. We don't want them to crawl and make noises while they're crawling. We want the exertions they're making and the breathing, but we don't want them to create sound effects while they are working with us. If they're a remote record actor or actress, we don't want to capture their own, um, you know, the sound of their room that they're in, we want everyone to sound like they're in the same room. So we're going to use some tips and tricks to, uh, to try and accomplish this task that many podcasts could use and, and just don't, that don't even take that much time or effort that can create this grand illusion and make it more powerful. The picture I'm showing you is two people chatting on top of a rooftop overlooking a city while one is picking their nose. And that's, it's kind of a funny, you know, you've got an action going on, you've got an interesting setting, you've got some sounds that you could think of for the location. And they're also creating motion as they're wearing kind of these bulky clothes. So we're gonna do this through motion foley, which is the sounds of the nose picking, the sounds of kind of moving around, typically made by just brushing your arm or, or moving around as if you're the character, you the foley artist. And if you don't do foley, you would maybe skip the section or, or have a friend of yours try recording it. Um, Next is equalization, which is kind of for we're going to dumb this down and just say it's a, a type of volume control. Reverb, which is a sense of space. Normalization and compression, which is trying to get more uh, dynamic loudness to your and softness to your audio without uh, making it too difficult. And finally, asking your actors for more retakes uh, if they're remote actors, because that's the nature of trying to make it perfect. You want it perfect, and sometimes you will have to do that. And it's never a bad thing. So remote acting, uh, a lot of people, uh, when we were making this presentation startup, asked questions about remote acting and how do you make it sound so organic? None of the productions I've ever worked on had two actors in the same room talking to one another or even one actor talking to another actor remotely. They just get a script and they read it themselves, three takes, and they get it to us. So remote acting is, is fairly tough and not all scripts are created equal. You really have to, within the script that you're sending to your actors, define are they yelling over really loud wind? Are they whispering? Where are they spatially to one another? Is, is one person hollering while they're doing an action? Are they exerting themselves while they're running? We want to capture the correct performance from the actor that is in line with what you're making as a sound designer. So it's really important that the script does this if you're not working directly with someone, if you're not directing them, that the script gives them the direction. You're really out of breath and you're jumping over hurdles while you're talking to someone. I don't know why you're having a conversation during this race, but that's, that's our script, we're going with it. Now, the recording environment of the actor is also your enemy. In New York City, it's very difficult to get uh, good audio if you're not in a studio or if you've soundproofed your, your room. And you might pick up the sounds of cars in the distance or an ambulance going by. So I always ask for multiple takes. Uh, a lot of people doing it ask for usually two to three takes, and that helps to some degree. But our goal as a sound designer is to eliminate their environment and to get it as quiet as possible and to make it as, as clean as possible so everyone else can be in the same space, occupying the same fictional space in this grand illusion that is acting. Now, uh, with, with that in mind, um, you can do some tips and tricks and we'll get into those, but matching tone as well. So the two actors are talking to each other. One is yelling to try and, because it's across the room. So we're, we're talking very far to the person on the other side of the room. The other actors are replying with like whispered tones. 
So you really need to make sure that you're either directing or your script is directing to acquire this. Mistakes that they make can also sound really wonderful. So if they flub a line, maybe it sounds really genuine and that can be great too. And then again, if you're editing things together and it doesn't sound like it's in the same space, you can always ask for retakes and send them an example of what you cut and say, this is what you need to change. Now, how is this relevant to sound design? Well, all of the things I just mentioned are directly applicable to exactly what you'll be doing if you're a Foley artist, if you're recording your own sound effects, if you are pulling in sound effects from the internet into your digital audio workspace and uh, doing the same thing. You're gonna record yourself getting slapped in the face eight different times and only one of them is going to sound good. You know, maybe it sounds better if I slap my arm and then you get four or five takes of that and then only one of those is good and then you'll have to manually do this. There's no like one and done. It's, it's a lot of work to really hone your sound and get it perfect unless you're very lucky, which does happen. Now, another thing is called Franken Dialogue. Uh, Franken Dialogue on the bottom of the uh, presentation, you will see um, two characters speaking. Uh, each horizontal field represents one character talking left to right equals time. Uh, one of them is no lira, one of them is uh, a computer or something. And you can see that the beginning of a sentence is cut with the middle of another sentence of a different take and so forth to, to take out sound. And uh, there's a little bit of crossfading on some of them. So you can, you can use different takes and pull it all together to create one performance that sounds wonderful. And you can do that with your sound effects as well. That's the purpose of this, uh, this image is to show you also that you can do that with your sound effects. They don't have to be one sound effect to represent one action. You can combine, you can edit. Uh, there, there are no rules and you will always be learning new things regardless of how long you've been doing it. Casey Wayland has been doing this forever and uh, he is still constantly learning new things. Uh, Pinarno Casey, he has like the number one audio drama podcast called We're Alive, and it's, it's fabulous, really great sound design as well. Now, Foley acting. So let's say you wanna learn a little bit about Foley, or maybe you don't, but you wanna know at least what these people are doing. They're creating a sense of space. You have these voices that are disembodied in a room that you've created that's hopefully not, uh, not just an empty room, it's maybe got some character to it, but how do we make sure that we feel like they're in that room? We do that with footsteps, we do that with motion sounds, that's getting a microphone and recording the sound of cloth, maybe as they're heavily breathing or as they're walking or picking up something. Uh, there's the timing element, which is, as you can see in the image, someone's kicking uh, someone else in the face. The actor has said, oof, and one actor says, yeah, and we have them in the right order but we need to make sure that impact sound precedes the person going oof by just enough, not too much. We don't want oof, and we don't want oof, or the opposite of oof. It has to, the timing is really important on this stuff, and you'll, you'll feel it by ear uh, and, and keep working at this, and your ear knows what, feel, what sounds good because you naturally listen to these things as you experience life. And, Maybe you're not focusing on them, but the more you do focus on what you're listening to in life, the stronger you will be as a Foley artist and the stronger you will be as an audio editor. Now, Franken editing, as I mentioned before, so you will be using different parts. Maybe that uh, the oof, you didn't like the whole part of the oof and you'll, you'll take a piece of that or uh, with the hit, you didn't like some of the hit because at the end of the hit, you can hear someone's cat screeching in the background, but you have a second hit where you don't hear the cat screeching, so you'll steal the tail end. But it, we really get into one thing which is called layering. To create audio depth, you will combine multiple sound effects to create the illusion of one action because frequency, as we're about to discover, is somewhat complex but easy to understand with visualizations. So what is equalization? This, this term that I've been using a lot, uh, equalization or EQ is, as it's called, is a detailed form of volume control. On the bottom left, you will see a bunch of little knobs up is louder, down is softer. That's the principle of, of volume control. Equalization is where you have one sound or one track and you are editing different frequency ranges. Let's not get into any of the scientific stuff of it. High end frequencies are the sounds of like the hind of like the pouring sugar or you know the sound of um, really uh, when someone's coming through like a radio. They, they don't sound normal, they sound distorted. It's a higher frequency. Um, higher frequencies can also be the sound of like uh, little rain droplets. Not the impact of the rain, but the sound of rain in the air, that shh sound that you'll think of. 
mid tones, uh, mid, mid frequency, which is sort of the middle of the of those different graphs. So it's it's uh, low, mid, high. You can see from left to right, uh, the middle five are, are sort of the mids. The right right three are high. The left three are low. Mid frequencies are uh, generally speaking, the human voice is kind of mid and low. Uh, mid frequencies could be the sounds of a, a salt uh, a salt or, or pepper shaker shaking. It could be a lot of different sounds. Many things are mid-tone. And low, if you're pouring over a bowl of candy and a bowling ball hits the sand, that thunk, that is low end frequency. It's all that really good bassy tone. Impact sounds are low frequencies combined with decent mid frequencies and probably a small little bit of a high frequency sound. And we combine all these things to create the illusion of actions that are taking place. So you don't need to think of a sound effect as a single clip. You can think of it as a complex series of effects that combine to create the desired outcome of the illusion of a single action, because they, they can be quite complex. Now, while you're raising and lowering these, you don't want to raise them too high. Uh, on the bottom right, you'll see these lines that just go off the page uh, and off the, the bar. It's called clipping. It's called, um, it has quite a few names, actually, but clipping is the only one I can think of right now. Clipping is bad. It, when It's a distortion when your sound is too loud. It exceeds zero decibels. You don't need to know that. Just if it goes off the screen and you, you see the sound, goes flat, it flat lines, like if it's a heartbeat monitor and it goes too high and just stays there, you are doing what's called clipping, or you're too hot. That's another phrase that's used. And it is a distortion of your sound because it's not... I'm going to butcher this, but the short answer is it's not recording properly. It's not capturing the sound properly, or you've distorted it now because it's too loud for your uh, digital audio workspace or whatever you're listening through to hear it properly. So you're, you're degrading the sound by making it too loud. Now, the relevance of this, let's see if I can switch the share button. Um, I'm now going to share an actual digital audio workspace. You can see this, this one sound. This is the sound uh, over here of an impact. We have a guy saying something, he's in the orange, because I color code everything to make it a little bit easier. So dialogue for me is one color. The ambience sounds are a different color, which I use as blue, and the sound effects are green. And if you use prefixes on these, like SFX for sound effects, and CHA for characters, and AMB for ambience, or whatever system works for you, you can save yourself a lot of time because I can visually immediately tell what sound effects are while I'm working in my workspace. And that's a, a time saver. Again, just a little thing that'll save you 30 seconds here, 30 seconds there, that'll add up over the course of your editing life to hours of your time. So we've got this sound effect. That's someone hitting the ground. We've got the physical smack. And then we've got a third sort of smack sound. So these combine to create a Sound. We can't hear that. Ah, okay, shucks. You have to believe me when I say that they're there. <laughs> they combine to make the perfect impact sound and uh, you feel like you're getting smacked with something metallic. Leaving this little, uh, also you'll notice um, I did equalize each one of these sound effects, but you're not gonna hear a difference, I guess, because you can't hear the sound effects. So I, I scooped out, so they all sound like they're in the same space. And it's really, the only thing that I'm doing is I'm, I'm playing with equalization on sound effects layers so that they feel like uh, they, they, sound, they sound correct with the other sound effects that I'm playing with and the voices that I'm playing with. I also do this to all the vocal tracks. They all sound like they're in the same room. Because uh, EQ, again, you're only as good as your worst microphone. And if one microphone sounds distinct, that's a bad thing. So you want to make, try and make everybody sound like they're on the same microphone, even if they're not, even if they're recorded in the same space. Uh, moving a little bit forward, um, reverb is your next amazing tool that you probably have access to if you're using a Reaper or a Mixcraft or a Pro Tools. It's built in. It's this weird button and too much of it is a bad thing, but very little is a beautiful thing. What is reverb? If you think of sound as basically being you're, you're talking to somebody and then you also have this reverberation of the room. So reverb is the reverberation of the room in a very dumbed down way. So it's the difference between sound, sounding like you're in an enclosed bathroom, or if you're sounding like you're outside yelling at someone, or if you're in a 
a train station. It has a lot of echo to it. You think of it as being echo. It could actually be just reverb, not a true echo effect. So reverb is creating a sense of space, bouncing the sound off of a non-existent room to make your actors and actresses feel like they're actually in that non-existent room. And doing the same with your sound effects as well, which is very important. Because uh, if your uh, sound effects don't have reverb and your actors do, chances are it's gonna sound a little bit weird. But that's another thing, uh, play with reverb, get better with reverb, become friends with reverb, and uh, just experiment, it's key. Next up is dynamics. If you listen to a great performance of an orchestra, they have what's called dynamics. They'll get really soft, they'll get really loud. And there's a difference from one to the other. You're not playing with the volume knob, it's just naturally like that within the song because it is emotion and it's, uh, it's a part of the human experience. Voices are like that, sound effects are like that. And it's, so the dynamic range is the loudest point to the most quiet point. And the goal of certain tools like compression and normalization are to prevent your loudest point from being too loud. That's called normalization. It brings the loudest point to zero decibels, which is the place you never want to exceed, uh, for, for lack of a better term at absolute worst. And then compression is trying to get everything to sort of the same area and limiting that dynamic range. Uh, too much compression is a bad thing. It will distort your sound. Uh, any compression will distort your sound, but uh, perhaps not noticeably. Most people can't tell the difference between an MP3 and a wave. Uh, if you, there are tests online where you can take and listen to and you, you can't tell the difference, uh, most likely, unless you're listening on very good headphones and you're a very uh, self-professed audiophile. So in the same regard, compression can be your friend and it can save you hours of manually adjusting your actors and actresses so that all of their performance is generally at the same volume or your sound effects are at generally the same volume. So there are tools to be used that I'm not gonna get too deep into, but they're there. So better sounds, better practices, multiple layers, not putting all of your sound effects on one track will save you time if you have multiple different tracks. It's sometimes easier because it allows you to layer them and it can be uh, discuss the stuff we discussed earlier. You can also color your tracks, which were discussed earlier. You can label them, combining multiple sounds to create actions if you're not feeling like that oomph, doesn't have enough oomph in that footstep sound. Thinking in frequencies, low, mid, and high, maybe the oomph isn't actually a problem with the sound effect itself. Maybe it just needs to be equalized so that it matches the rest of the scene or it needs some reverb. Um, with this amazing sound, soundscape that you create, also remember that voices are generally the stars of the show. So after you're done putting 20 hours a week into your amazing, beautiful soundscape, you have to be really, really quiet because the voices are very important. We need to hear what the, the actors are saying because they are the story. You're, you're supporting the story with sound typically, um, unless you're a non-vocal audio drama experimental type, which those are fun too, but different. So uh, where can you find sound effects if you're not a Foley artist? Freesound.org has a lot of free ones. They're great. If it says attribution, you put them in your credits. If it says non-attribution, great. You don't have to credit them and you can use them. You can still credit them. It's a nice thing to do. There are other libraries you can purchase or like uh, on Sonis, S-O-N-N-I-S has uh, some really great libraries. It's literally like you're going to the library and purchasing a book of sounds. And it's like 30 plus sounds for a decent bargain value. There are also places like podcastmusic.com, which is not just for music. They will sell you individual sounds. So let's say you only need the sound of a particular firework. You can go there, pay two bucks, buy the one firework and be done with it. And you have a license for that one firework sound indefinitely for whatever you work on. And that's very useful for typically around $2. Another important thing, again, fake sounds can be better than real sounds. Uh, Casey Whalen's book, Bombs always beep went into really good detail about, uh, he was making a Molotov cocktail and he threw this bottle uh, filled with liquid on the ground and it shattered and exploded and it sounded awful. It didn't sound anything like real glass shattering as we think of real glass shattering. So he actually wound up cheating and using a completely different sound to create the sound of a Molotov cocktail. So never feel like you have to be genuine when you're shooting actors with guns or start stabbing people. You, you, can, you can cheat, you don't actually have to hurt the actors. So real isn't always better, and the sound effects that you can create or find online um, can, can oftentimes be a lot better, especially for like gross, disgusting noises. You can literally just grab a, a wet towel and kind of squeeze it or, you know, play with it, smack it against things. And that's some of the most gross sounds you'll ever hear is just a moist towel. Creating a perspective, getting into some really quick uh, end, of, end of presentation stuff. 
who is your point of view? Who are we following auditorily? Is it the main character? Is it behind the main character? Is it above the main character? Is it somewhere else in the room? Is it a fixed point in the room? Uh, we do found footage stuff. So sometimes we'll have a recorder that gets left behind. So that's important to think as you are using volume to tell people they're further away from the microphone or closer to use panning to say things are to the left or to the right. Um, which you can do, but don't do an extreme. Never pan like more than 20% typically uh, to either side because some people listen to podcasts with one earbud in and they'll have no idea what's happening. Another quick thing on a time saver, you can use buses and chains. What is a bus? What is a chain? They're the same thing. They're synonymous. Bus is an easier word to use for me right now. All of your sound effects that you've just recorded for a scene now get on the bus. The bus moves in one direction. Everyone is moving in the same direction with this bus. Now we apply the reverb for your bathroom. You now have a bathroom reverb, you apply it to the bus. Everyone on the bus now has that reverb applied to them. So buses are basically like chaining multiple tracks together and uh, applying one effect on the bus that affects everything, be it volume, be it reverb, be it echo or something else. I also like to add a few things. Never go backwards, keep going forwards. Don't remix and remaster old things you did because the new stuff you're gonna do is 10 times better. You're gonna your actors are gonna be better because they've done that before and now they're better to do the new thing. A lot of people want to see progression and growth. So that you're a great first episode that you've remixed and now episode two is kind of not as good. And even your season finale is not as good as your first episode. So that's kind of weird. So I, I would say always keep going forward, always keep creating. Uh, and that's that's just a personal thing. You don't have to take my word for it, but it's it's one that audiences will sometimes really would prefer just to hear new things coming from you. And the time it took you to make the old thing sound a little bit better. Uh, also, huge time saver. Let's say you've got a season of work with the same characters in some similar locations. Make a single session for the entire season. So in your digital audio workspace, your whole season is now in one session. So now the intro, copy and paste. It's now the same thing. You don't have to re-import your music and refine your intro voice and align it all. You've just saved yourself, like probably over the course of a 20 minute episode, 10 uh, episode season, you will easily save an hour of work or more at the absolute minimum by using a single session for your season. So, or you can just save your presets. Uh, a lot of DAWs will allow you to save presets for things like that as well. Lastly, and the most important thing, don't listen to your final MP3 that you're going to send out to the world on a set, set of really nice headphones. Listen in your car, listen on some crappy speakers of your laptop. Your audience isn't going to listen to your amazing um, 3D soundscape thing like you're going to listen to it. They're going to listen with one earbud in while they're cooking. They're going to listen on their cell phone because their Bluetooth won't sync to their car in a cup holder. Like, so try and make it and, and cater to the, the lowest common denominator to make sure that your story is still understandable as you're making these complex soundscapes to the, the easiest possible way for someone to enjoy your story and, and try to be accessible in that way is, unless that's your thing and your niche is that you're inaccessible, but that's probably not something to uh, aspire to. Uh, I forgot one last thing. There, there are three plugins that are kind of cool that you might like or not. Melodyne is pitch correction. Um, they used it in the Portal video game series to make their robots sound like really cool robots. Musicians use them to sing on pitch, and it's it comes in some DAWs. Uh, it comes free with Mixcraft, and it can be purchased for fairly inexpensively. Uh, if you have access to Contact, maybe you're a musician, uh, you can use some of the sounds in Contact. It's a really great digital uh, virtual music library. Basically, it creates all sorts of sounds. They're a lot of fun and uh, you can do more than just music with it. It can create footsteps, digital footsteps. As you're typing on your keyboard, every click is now the sound of a footstep, thanks to uh, virtual tools like Edward, which plays with contact, and there are many other things that work with it as well. Finally, Speakerphone 2, which I've only just started using. It, if you're using a fantasy podcast, ignore it. If you're doing a sci-fi, it's probably worth it. Uh, if if you're doing it for the rest of your life or it's if you've got the money, it's, it's very expensive, but it has thousands of different uh, speakers. One's from trains, one from dolls you pull the string towards, and it's the preset. So now the, the voice or the sound effect you put in sounds like it's a pull string doll saying like, vote for me. And it, all you have to do is click one button and it's done. And it sounds like that or a different button and now you're in a different speaker or a busted speaker or a vinyl radio or something from the 1920s, one of those gramophone things. 
it, it, so many different settings and they're uh, all pretty cool, but only these tools are only as good as they're going to be used. So I would only say get them if you absolutely think that this is going to save you time. Otherwise, it's just worth not getting them and, and not investing money and investing the money in yourself or your team and really growing and trying to get a better uh, computer system or something. So again, that, this is storytelling with sound, creating worlds, telling stories with sound. And uh, thank you very much for sticking through this presentation. All right, so our next presentation is going to be by Sarah. Our next presentation by Sarah is going to be on the mixing and mastering. So it's going to be more of the technical side. I will skip over some stuff on mine because Travis covered a bit of stuff, so I won't overlap too much. And then I'll get into the mixing and mastering portions. Okay, so I don't know if Travis covered this spotting. This is something really important that sound designers will use before you even start designing sounds. It's basically a roadmap. You're reading through the script and you're making notes. What exactly sound, what exact sounds do I need when I need them? What the perspective is or the point of view and if any voice design is required. And I will get to a more detailed description of what voice design is later. No, why is it not going to the next one? There we go. Textures, so Travis covered most of that, so I will just skip to the creature design portion and give you guys a little bit of tips on how to design them, because this, this one's a little tricky. So it still uses your basic layering techniques, and there's a few different ways you can do it. Most of the time you're gonna be using animal sounds, or you can dive into vocoding. Vocoding is when you're using the human voice as a trigger and you're mixing it in with a sample that's usually an animal and it makes you sound like an orc. Like Lord of the Rings orcs is the greatest example I can think of that uses vocoding for voice design. It's actually the people are taking the voices and putting boar and bear sounds into them and using the voice to trigger. Okay, so for this example, I just used animal sound effects. For creature and voice design, you want to use really high sample rates. And the reason why you want to do that is because artifacting is a thing. What is artifacting? Usually when you have a lower sample rate, you can't manipulate your audio as much because there's just not enough information and then you're audio is going to get bubbly or distorted and it's just not going to do the effect that you want. So usually for creature and monster design you want to record at minimum 96 kilohertz. This is for your samples and your voice. 192 is great but um, not everyone can do that with their setups so try to aim for 96 kilohertz. So this creature All right, so what am I doing in this one? Creature 101, bears and pigs are your go-to. It's in pretty much everything and you just mangle them as much as you can. Um, down, shift, down pitch shifting, even sometimes distorting sounds on purpose. And so the next sample is my first layer. <laughs> of the creature. So this is actually a bear downshifted and I'm using a chorus effect with it. So that's just delay, delaying the signal and then mixing it in with the original signal. This is a pig squeal. This is to give it that kind of serpenty sound. And I'm actually distorting it on purpose. Usually clipping and distorting is bad, but sometimes in sound design, you do it on purpose. It gives a different kind of texture. And I also added some reverb to draw it out and thin it out a bit. And I don't know if anyone could even guess what that is. That's actually just white noise. So this is the synthesis part. Sometimes you're not even using animals. You're just literally using white noise. 
from a signal generator and adjusting the attack and decay from it. Another common technique, which is used in the Jurassic Park dinosaurs, is using metallic sounds, hydraulics mixed in with animals. So your T-Rex, for example, is actually just a hydraulic press going up, and I believe it's sea cows or sea lions. They're guttural sounds. That's all it is. Two very simple sounds. So yeah, in summary, using textures can help build your soundscape. Not just beef up your sound effects, but the overall soundscape, which I believe Travis covered, so I will skip that. Okay, so here are some common tools for voice sound design, which I will go over, because it doesn't matter which plugins you have, they're all relatively the same, they do relatively the same thing. So in this chain, I'm using Nectar 2 from Isotope. I cannot rec recommend Isotope enough. Their plugins are great. And if you start with their elements package, you can slowly cross grade up to the normal tier and then even to the advanced tier. It's a lot cheaper and they give really great cross grade upgrades. So that's why I like them. You can start out from the lowest and eventually make your way up to the highest for a lot cheaper. Okay, so what is going on in this plugin chain? Okay, so pitch shifting is very common. And so we have pitch shifting, EQ, harmony compressor, FX, saturation, and reverb active. What's highlighted here is also the order in which it is processed. So depending on the order of your effects and plugins will make the sound sound different. There is no right or wrong um, plugin chain for voice design. So have fun with it and just experiment. So in this case, pitch shifting is very simplistic. Like for this one, I didn't even bother screenshotting because I'm only doing it by like two semitones. You don't want to go extreme because you don't need a lot to get a result. You want to still be very subtle. So always try with the lowest setting and work your way up. That is the general rule for all plugin processing. Always start at the bare minimum and work your way up. So where it starts here is the harmony. That's the first one. Harmony is a great way to make that otherworldly demon or god sort of sound effect with the voice. So in this case, I have four voices active. So that's like four different voice layers from the original signal. And I just have sometimes unison, just playing the same one over and just ver um, changing the speed in which it plays back will work. And in this case, I just have one layer that's up by two semitones. Sometimes that's all you need. You, you, you just play around with that. And like sometimes you can do octaves up or down. It just depends on the person's voice who is performing it because not one setting will work for everyone's voice. So the compression here, I'm actually using what's called parallel compression. This is a little more advanced than normal compression. So what is parallel compression? It basically takes a dry or lightly compressed signal and mixes it with a heavily compressed version of the original signal. It's just, it's kind of a unique texture. It's a certain textural sound. It's not to keep your signal from peaking. It's used as a sound design element. So moving on to the effects, what I have is the distortion is actually active. Some plugins, even if it's at 0%, it's still applying the, the effect. So I have the overdrive to seven, but because it's at 0%, it's just a very subtle amount of distortion to the voice. And then I have a flanger. So if you don't know what a flanger is, it copies the signal thus far and delaying it by a small amount measured in milliseconds. And then I have a delay on, which it's called echo in this case, and just a very subtle amount. You see, you only have 7.6%. Sometimes that's all you need. And then moving on to saturation, what is saturation in audio? 
it's actually a form of distortion. Again, normally we think distortion is bad, but in this case, it excites usually the upper harmonics using distortion and it gives just a nice texture. In this case, I'm using a lot because it was used as a goddess sound. I can't say which show or a sound sample because the episode isn't out yet. And then the amount overall is still below 50% and using tube. The, the analog retro tape tube and warm is simulating old school analog gear is essentially what it is. There is no right or wrong one to use. It all just has a slightly different tone to it. And you just pick whichever one you think sounds best. All right. And then reverb. Travis already went through that, so I won't explain that. And again, usually, sometimes you don't need a lot. I cannot stress that enough. Always start at the lowest amount. Like, I rarely go past 20%, because otherwise, your sound effects or dialogue is going to be inaudible. You're not going to understand what it's supposed to be. Okay, now on to the specifics of mixing. A basic guide of tips, tricks, and issues to look out for. With mixing, the general rule is you always want to focus around your dialogue levels. Everything else is going to be leveled based around your dialogue, so you have to get that healthy first. And before you start mixing, you need to make sure that any unneeded frequency content has been removed. When you're mixing, think about you only have so much space with your lows, mids, and highs. And you have so many different sound elements interacting together that if you don't need it, get rid of it so something else can come through. So for example, in the voice, usually for male voices, 80 hertz and below, you can silence that. And so that frees up that range of frequencies. And so if you have an explosion rumble, that's gonna come through without too much trouble because you got rid of lower frequencies that just aren't needed because there is not a lot of useful frequency content, 80 hertz and below for male voices. Okay, so recommended levels for dialogue. Your meter should be around minus 12 to minus 10 dBFS. Minus 15 at the lowest, you can get away with 20, minus 20, but you have to be careful when you get to the mastering stage, which I will talk about later. If it's that low and it's not clean, you're going to have an overabundance of potential background noise that you don't want coming through. So if you have a level that low, you need to ensure that it's been cleaned thoroughly in the editing stage. So once your dialogue is at a consistent level, you can start processing. Okay, backtracking a bit, this is a screenshot of a spectrogram taken from RX, from Isotope. You can use one from Reaper, so that's a little more accessible for people because RX is a little bit expensive. So what I meant by unneeded frequency content, so that low end I mentioned. Always keep in mind your fundamental frequency of the voice. So that's what's circled in green. And any clicks too, like so spit clicks or digital clicks, that can actually muddy your mix and make your high end or mid range unclear. And sometimes you don't even need to EQ your voice that much. If you remove all those clicks, it just opens right up. And then you also want to make sure that your room tone, see this is a really high amount of room tone here in this file. You want to make sure that this is all cleaned out because this is so much frequency content that could possibly mask your other sounds. And then your other sounds will get buried. And since we don't need that information, why have it? So when you're processing your dialogue at the mix stage, Think of what can I remove rather than what I can boost. That is a good method to have in the back of your mind. Once all problematic frequencies are dealt with, that's when you start sweetening. So it's not uncommon to have different EQs in your processing chain, to have more than one. 
So you can have your first EQ to get rid of the problematic frequencies, and then you can have a one after that that will sweeten it. And then I will go later to um, mixing buses, and you'll have another one on top of that. So when you're EQing the voice, though, it helps to know what is the frequency range of voices. A spectrogram will help if you're not very good at estimating just by your ear because it shows you exactly what is in there so that can help you figure out oh, okay so this part looks a little brighter so maybe i need to remove the 400 to 600 hertz area is your boxy sounding dialogue is when your mid-range is getting muddy or 200 hertz in the low end when it's your lower frequency sounding muddy. A spectrogram can just help you figure out what is going on and what might be useful to remove or to sweeten. Um, there's, you can do an easy Google search. There's graphs to show you what exactly is the frequency range of male and female voices to help you out. There's a lot of information about that. One processing that isn't talked about a lot is called transient shaping. It is a form of compression, but it only targets the attack and consonant of the voice. So, and the thing to remember with your transients or consonants, they're more likely to be distortion causing error areas because they're higher in amplitude. So rather than compressing the entire voice, because sometimes the entire voice doesn't need compression, and sometimes you don't want that compressed sound on your voice. So if you're finding only the Ks or harsh sounds are peaking or sound kind of harsh, transient shaping might be your better option than using just a normal compressor. And then frequency exciting. Frequency exciting is harmonic distortion. Again, you think, oh, I don't want distortion, but sometimes it actually helps. Um, it's most commonly used in the higher frequencies. It can sweeten your tone of any sound element, but on the voice, use a very low amount because you don't need much to start hearing the results. Usually, I only use like 3%. To go. It just kind of makes the high, higher mid-range to the high end more defined, and it cuts through the mix better. It really depends on what's going on in your mix, if you need it or not. Okay, panning. This is the, it can be fun, but it can also cause headaches because it can make people dizzy or just sound weird. Because when we hear in the natural world, we're never just hearing out of one ear. We have directionality, but it's always going to be through both ears. So we need to try to simulate the human ear as much as possible. So for upfront sounds, I never really pan past 20% so that it doesn't cause dizziness. It can be more than 20% though, but you have to be very careful. If you're going to hard pan 50% or more, these are going to be in the background. So say you're in a forest, you're going to hear leaves, birds, maybe animal critters running through the underbrush. All of these is frequency content that could possibly mask your dialogue or other sound effects. So if they're not super important, but they're there as a texture, you can hard pan these. But you, what you have to do is make sure that they're low enough in volume that you just hear them. You don't want them overbearing. So what I do with my fader is I bring it down until it's just there. And if I bring it down anymore, it'll disappear. If I'm panning more than 50%. This is how I get away with hard panning and making your soundscape more 3D. Panning can also be used to unmask sounds. What is frequency masking? Well, unfortunately, frequencies are complicated and they don't play nice with each other most of the time. And it's not just the frequencies overlapping with each other between your dialogue, sound effects, foley, or music. It's also the loudness 
of each that can affect masking as well. So what do we do about it? There's a few ways to treat frequency masking and padding can be your first step to it. Sometimes if you, if you need a sound that's upfront, but you can't hear, it's like, oh, where did the detail go of my footsteps that are from my main character, which is centered? Try doing it just subtly eight to 10% because people aren't gonna notice that it's off to the side with that little amount. You, you can really fool people. By doing it to that eight to 10%, it's all of a sudden gonna open up, hopefully. However, if panning isn't helping with frequency masking, there are plugins to help you with that. EQing is another technique to help with frequency masking, but I would try panning first because it's simpler. Um, for example, Isotope Neutron, I think it might only be in the advanced version or the standard and up. And it has a chart when you enforce it that will tell you what frequencies are masking each other and what you need to pull down to bring the sound you want up in the mix. Okay, so say you want to create movement because who doesn't want a 3D soundscape? So how do you do that without making people dizzy? Because that is a serious, easy issue to happen. Ease into it. So if someone is walking up behind the main point of view, you can hard pan that all the way to the left, but have it so low that when it first starts, you can't actually hear it, but it's playing. And then you slowly bring up the volume and pan automation going a slope from left slowly to the center. And if they're walking away from the character, this can be used as car drive-bys too. And then you just slowly go to the right and then you fade out the volume. Panning and volume go together like peanut butter and jelly. You have to use them together to get that natural effect or it's gonna end up sounding weird and learn about the acoustics of perspective. This can be a little bit tricky at first, but the most common way really to learn how to do it is just go out and listen to your natural world. So this is ha has to do with Travis mentioned earlier with your reverb and your EQ. So think about how far away is that sound? its EQ profile is going to be different. So not just the reverb added to it, but is the sound going to be thinner or muddier? This is what is going to give you your realistic soundscape and really immerse your listener. If you don't learn about acoustic perspective and how sounds interact in real life, it's always going to sound fake. There are plugins that can automatically do this to you, but they are quite pricey. So there's one from Sound Particle. That's all it does is get the distance reverberation. Um, a little while ago, it was on sale for $99. So that's actually cheap for your fancier plugins. So if that's something that you just want a plugin to do for you, just look for sales. Buses. So there's two different types of ways you can use buses. And one of them Travis already um, talked about, but I will add to what he said. So the first is using a mix bus. What is a mix bus? You're basically sending 100% of your audio signal to an auxiliary track. So in red circled, that's the output. So that's 100%. Why do I want to do this? Well, unfortunately, again, frequencies don't like to play well with one another. So when you're mixing, you need to make sure all the dialogue is playing nice. So you can have masking, phasing, um, issues like that. So you need to make sure before your dialogue is even playing nice with your sound effects, Foley and music, you need to make sure it's playing nice with each other first if people are talking over one another. 
So th this is an easy way to do it. And this is how, when you put your processing on. So you can, if it not only sweetens it at the same time, you can f correct issues too. So I usually use Neutron from Isotope. There I treat all of the dialogue at the same time. Once I know the phase is good and there's no masking, I usually take care of masking on the individual tracks. I just find that easier. So then the processing on the dialogue bus is the final processing for the dialogue as a whole. And I do this for each sound element to make sure I can hear everything playing clearly. So I won't be playing any other sound element while I'm doing this. So when I'm working on the sound effects, I'm only playing the sound effects and making sure I can hear all of the different sounds. Nothing is being hidden. Nothing is distorting because when you sum them together, they may be playing nicely on their individual tracks, but sometimes they can overload it when they're summed down. So sometimes you do need to put a limiter or a compression on your buses to ensure when the sounds are summed down that there is no peaking or distortion that you don't want. So you do this for each sound element and then finally you do one last step which is mastering. This is sending everything to your stereo master fader. Okay, so sorry, backtracking. <laughs> Uh, what are send buses? So when you're working with reverb, delay, um, even distortion plugins like that, you typically don't want to use 100% of your audio signal being wet. You always want to have your dry signal mixed in with a wet signal. So this is where send buses come in. So in Pro Tools, it's going to be different in every DAW. So you're going to have a place where you set up which output to use. And you'll have a fader. That's the part that will always be the same. You're telling it how much of the level to send. So if you're sending dialogue, for example, to a reverb send, usually I don't go past minus 20, like that is the max amount I will send. Otherwise it gets muddy. For other effects, so in this example for this screenshot, I'm using a radio effect. These people are talking like a radio. So I want a little more of the signal to be affected, but I still want to have the dry signal so it still is clear and you understand what they're saying. It may sound 100% affected, but it's actually not. To keep it clear, you still have your dry, untouched signal mixed in with the distortion. And that's why send effects are really nice to use. But another thing you have to be careful of, if you're using panning automation, you have to make sure that your send effect is following the panning. So in Pro Tools, I just press a button and it automatically does that for me, it copies the panning automation. So you might have to do that by hand. So if your drive voice is say 20% to the right and you're using a send effect, make sure that send effect is also panned to the right or you lose any sense of your 3D movement or stereo image. Okay, now moving on to mastering. So this is dealing with all of your sound elements as a whole. There are a few different ways to do this. This is very different from music mastering for audio drama. In music, you typically only work with the summed down stereo file. In audio drama, you don't necessarily have to do that. You can just put all your processing on the master fader track because that is last in line in your signal flow. So when you start mastering, your mix has to be technical error free. By the time you get this far, you can't have any phasing or, or masking or the mastering just doesn't work. It's the final glue and polish to your sound. What does this mean? It actually means you're only doing subtle processing. There should be no extreme 
EQ or compression. That should all be done on the mixing side. This is just the very final sweetening to make sure everything is still dynamic but clear. All the frequency pockets are audible. The lows, mids, and highs can all be heard clearly. And then finally, once you get your subtle processing done, people have their own techniques. Like there is no right or wrong way to do it. So in my case, I have EQ and I have two compressors going, but it's very subtle compression. One compressor is dealing with just the low end and the other one, because it comes after that in the signal, is dealing with just the mid range and highs for it to all stay clear and intelligible for the dialogue. This, this mastering setup is for a show that's very dialogue focused and very light sound design. So once you're happy with your processing and your levels are consistent on your meter, you do your final normalization to the loudness scale. There are a few ways you can do this. Loudness is a very new way of metering an audio. I believe it's only been around since 2013 was really when it's been adapted more. So either you do it during the mix because there is, unfortunately, X dB does not equal X integrated loudness. So to get this right, if you can't get a plugin that normalizes it automatically at the end, you, you'll have to do it in the mix stage using a meter. If you're using a loudness meter, you basically have to watch the meter the whole time and see what the integrated loudness is doing and so you have to figure out okay what is making me go over is the low end causing too much loudness energy do i need to bring that down usually you have to sacrifice your sound effects or music a little bit with loudness because we want the dialogue up front but not all the time in audio there's an exception to every rule or you know a hundred exceptions to every rule but the best and easiest way is to use plugins that automatically normalize to the minus 16 LUKFS. However, you have to be super careful when you do this because if your mix isn't perfectly balanced, any balance mistake is gonna be accented if you do it this way. And it's always a good idea to get your target loudness as close as you can as possible if you are using a plugin to correct your loudness because of that. Um, plugins for that are, you can get from Isotope, it's called Loudness Control, it's a little pricey. Um, I believe Waves has one, Waves Audio is a great company as well, they have, really nice stuff and it'll go on sale for like $30 a plug-in occasionally so just keep your eyes out they have a decent loudness correction plug-in as well and that's really all there is to it that is the technical part of audio thank you sarah and it was very technical i can tell because i barely understand some of it i try but i don't <laughs> i hope it was helpful it was, it really was. Again, I love um, when I'm setting up these uh, presentations and we wanna give one that's a very basic understanding, which is what Travis's presentation was, which was like, okay, let's just get you started. And then we have the more technical aspects. That way, these presentations are applicable to people who have very little experience or a lot of experience in this kind of workspace. Um, we do have a lot of questions in the question box. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring that up. So we're gonna start with the questions for Travis. So feel free to unmute yourself, Travis. And the first few questions come from Scooter. So Scooter, if you wanna read your own questions, then you can feel free to do so. Sure. All right, what do you feel about background conversations for a scene? Um, you were talking about building the background, like audio scape with sound effects. I know several shows will have like, when you have a larger group of people, they'll have actual scripted conversations that are kind of like coffee chatter in the background. What do you feel as far as that goes? 
Oh, it's great. Uh, the more you can do like that, the better, the more custom for your show. I usually don't have time for that, so I'll cheat. But um, if you're able to actually record dialogue for a whole separate discussion taking place in your background, um, usually you can scoop out frequencies, uh, like Sarah was saying. So you would scoop out some of the, the mid-tone and you would have, again, the illusion of people talking because you're going to hear like the lower end of what they're saying on a frequency. For, for, it's hard to explain the frequency side of it without the visualizations, but you're not going to hear the words they're saying clearly. You're going to hear like the bassy sound of voices, if that makes sense. And you're going to hear a little bit of the high end clicking that maybe makes, if you don't EQ that out as well, but you can, you can play with EQ, you can put them behind a wall. So now it's just, you put what's called a low pass, which means you take out again, the mids and highs. Now they feel like they're through a wall or you can use panning and have them be maybe their center and your characters are panned uh, percentage side and side a little bit. So your characters are talking to each other and they're a little bit, and they're, they're significantly louder than the, the background chatter. Um, there, there are different ways you can go about it, but I think they're all valid and, and quite fun, depending on the situation. Okay. What script notes do you use to give context to lines when you're working with remote actors? Sure. Um, let us share a... Sure. Uh, script. So you can see this is Vast Horizon episode two. Mm -hmm. um, so first and foremost, I have her do a bunch of breathing because the whole show is the No Lira show, No Lira on a spaceship. So I've got like 10 seconds of her breathing uh, and, and, you know, recovering her breath. We've got uh, exertion of her opening a door, climbing out of a hatch, closing the hatch. Um, she's determined. So we give the like the emotion behind what she's doing, and then also sometimes surprised. Uh, and then in a lot of instances, we'll see things like Y-O-W will also be there, which is like yelling over wind if it was the white vault, or frustrated breathing exertions while fidgeting for a few seconds, or you'll see the same sort of thing like winded. So the character's winded and while they're running. I've got the recording of the breathing on its own track, which I'll use to gap between the dialogue as other things happen if that makes sense, perhaps? Yeah, I think so. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I have one other question for that part, let's see. Okay, my comment was, do you have any audio samples of good and bad timing? But I'm trying to think of what that applied to. Like I, impacts and stuff or like, you know? Yeah, yeah, I think it was that. Let me see if I can render a, uh, in export real quick. It'll take me literally 10 seconds and maybe it'll be loud enough. Fake, 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 one, use selection. Here we go. Okay, I'm about to, in theory, play for you, fake, 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 file one, which I'll have to delete because I put it in the wrong part of Dropbox and I'm going to get yelled at for doing so. Okay, uh, sharing audio, sharing computer sound and here we go. Uh, fake, fake, fake one. Ah! It's not working. No, uh, oh, maybe. We can hear that. Were you able to hear it? Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. So what's happening here? Can't hear that though. Ah, shucks. We heard the first one. The first time we could hear it nice and clear. Now we can't. Did you do something? Great. Here we go. Could open up a separate file. Here's the first one. I can't hear it. You can. What has happened from your perspective? Someone is screaming and then getting murdered. Yeah. I, I guess is kind of what you're hearing. Uh, by moving the scream to a different point on the track, uh, this is going to be the the bad version, as it were. So now we're going to listen to fake, fake, fake number two. Hopefully that sold and you're able to hear it. Uh, that's a little bit unclear what's happening. Someone's just screaming. Maybe someone's watching someone else get hit. But it's, it's not selling the fact that it's your, your protagonist or antagonist getting, getting hit. And then the final version of fairly good timing is uh, this will be really good. For the, I don't know if you can see the, the digital audio workspace I'm working in. But uh, it is quite fun, and our scream is uh, because as he's getting hit, his voice cuts out. 
So we're going to play you fake, fake, fake three with a little bit of short dialogue beforehand. You prefer to be struck by ice? Uh, yeah. It's like you're wrapping a paper bag with a plastic bag. Cool. Hopefully you could hear the difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, they so, it sounds like different scenes, different things are happening, and your audio, your dialogue made no sense. <laughs> oh, that, I, just, I literally stole dialogue, but um, if you're able to hear it, I would like to give you one last MP3, and that's with no EQ and no reverb. So it's, it's going to sound like it should before EQ and reverb. It's the same exact files, the same exact thing you just heard. Uh, there's no EQ or reverb. This is a really great thing to hear the power of. You prefer to be struck by ice? Uh, yeah. It's like you're wrapping a paper bag with a plastic bag. And again, it, it just, nothing sounds like it's in the same space. Uh, so EQ is your friend for making things occupy the same space. And so it's a little bit of reverb, if that answers the question. So all this audio file is telling me is that we need to have a 30 second story competition of it, LA. <laughs> and you gotta put a plastic bag inside of, I don't know what he's saying. Yeah, it's, it's great. <laughs> but no, that answers the questions, thank you. Cool. All right, so the next question um, was from Aman, but it's really late in England. So he sent me a message saying that he was gonna go to sleep, which is perfectly fine. But I did say that I was gonna ask his questions for him. So he asks, or is it the normal, to organize a script read through with all of the actors and do people use Skype for this? Uh, for us, the answer has been no. We never talk to any of our actors except one-on-one -on -one, and it's usually me doing the one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, Caitlin sends the script. I'm kind of like, I don't know, uh, if this is a religious metaphor, I'd be the, the prophet or something like saying, here's the script, we've got this beautiful script. And then I'd give it to the people individually. But they never talk to each other. They never talk to Caitlin. It's just kind of this weird dialogue. However, some productions like the, uh, the wonderful um, Alba Salix Royal Physician, they all do. And they will use, I believe they use Zoom for it, if Eli is still here with us. I don't know. But many productions do uh, use Zoom uh, if they do productions, which is, or uh, Squadcast is another one that's out there. Or Skype. Skype's acceptable too. It just has more latency. So, which means delay. So like you're a delay between each or everything, which is yeah. never as fun. Uh, I would like to add, uh, Aman, if you go and listen to the, the last, uh, or the second to last round table, it was about production, which has a lot more answers about um, getting, getting things ready with scripts and actors and everything else like that. So it may even have some more questions uh, answered in that one. All right. Uh, my, my question to Travis is on behalf of all of us people who start off at the very bottom and have no idea about sound design or mixing or mastering or anything like that. And you were talking about plugins like Contact. Uh, what exactly is a plugin? I know what the digital audio workspace is, but what does it mean when you have a plugin installed? So your digital audio workspace is where you do the work. Plugins are things that are not the workspace that go into the workspace or that you can use to edit your files out of your workspace. Um, so they're like, I'm going to use an old school metaphor here. When you have a Nintendo 64, it's a Nintendo 64 and you can play video games on your Nintendo 64. But there's a thing called an expansion pack that increase the graphical capability of the Nintendo 64. That's what they are. They're little additions. They're digital. They're not physical. You're not physically pushing it into your digital audio workspace because it's digital, but they're expansion packs that allow you to experience your audio uh, interface in new ways or allow you to tweak the audio or put in new virtual sounds in exciting and new fashions. Not all DAWs allow you to use all plugins, but it's, it's like software that you can put onto it. That would, that would be a much easier metaphor, actually. Just, it's software. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, Travis, you are next. You had the first question for Sarah. Uh, yeah. Um, so you mentioned a lot about recording things, Sarah, and uh, making these monster sounds. I was curious about recording rate. You mentioned that you record at higher than 441. For those of us who have no idea what this is, um, it's, it's like when you're recording, you just make sure it's 441. That's, that's the norm typically for what people are using. But if you're recording at a higher bit rate or um, enc encoding any of that stuff, can you pull it into your normal session and it'll sound normal or will it 
mess it up? Do you have to, you know, dumb it down as you as you try and pull it into your normal master session? Or are there secrets to that? I was a little bit confused. So basically what you're talking about is sample rate. Uh, is basically the higher your sample rate, the more information that is captured at recording. That's all it is. However, a very important thing to remember is you can always downsample, but you can't truly upsample because if you're upsampling, say you have 441, but you want to work at 96, well, that information wasn't captured, so you can't go from 441 to 96. So when you're working with higher sample rate files, you can either, if it's sound design, you can work in a separate session and work at 96 or whatever you corded it at, and then you can downsample. And then if you bring it into a, a 44.1 or a 48 session, you, it's converted and it'll play back at the right speed. So as long as you convert it, it will play back at the correct speed. And you would convert it in the original, in the, the higher sample one, you would convert it there? Yeah, after you're done with all your processing. Thank you very much. All right, our final questions that are in the chat um, are all from Scooter. So Scooter, would you like to go ahead and read your questions? Sure. So Sarah, what's your approach to vocoding? You kind of talked about the fact that you do it, but I didn't hear a whole lot of detail on that specifically. Yeah, I didn't give a lot of details on it because it is a little bit complex and you either need special hardware or software to do it. It doesn't always come with a DAW. So in a nutshell with vocoding is your voice will act as a trigger and whatever sample you have, once your voice triggers it, it will mix in a portion however much you, you set. So say you have a bare sample set up and your voice is going to trigger that. It will mix in 20% bare sound. This is using, back in the day, a synthesizer, a physical synthesizer, which has now been replaced with software. However, I personally don't like working with those because it is really complex. So there are plugins these days that take out all of the routing because the routing can get really complicated. I use Dehumanizer. So it basically takes that process and sums it down to just moving sliders. And so it just simplifies the whole process. So if you want to try using your voice for talking creatures, I, I would try getting Dehumanizer Simple Monsters first to try out because it, it just gets rid of all the audio engineering technical stuff. Gotcha, and that's a plugin by Krotos? Krotos Audio. Okay, um, what's the questions I had? Oh, right, when you were showing the layers for the voice, when you were splitting out the different parts of the FX chain, were those four separate recorded tracks, or was it one track that the FX was splitting into, was like basically creating three virtual tracks that you were manipulating. For the monster sound? Yeah, I think, no, or um, the one where you had it split out with all the different, visually, all the different um, parts of the chain were on the same screen. Oh, uh, the plugin chain? Yeah, for the first step of the plugin chain, you were talking about how there was four different track layers for the same sound. Oh, the, like the harmony? Yeah. Okay. Um, what would you like to know about the harmony? Are you creating the different recordings for that separately? No, it, what a harmony engine does is it creates, it takes the original voice and it pitches each one to harmonize with the original voice. Gotcha. So then you can slide around the, you can adjust the different values for it. Exactly. And they're like virtual tracks essentially, sort of. Um, that plugin in particular does it all in the plugin, so you're only working with one track, and so it simplifies it, so you're not looking at multiple tracks. Yeah, that's the main thing I wanted to know. Is, so it's all inside of the plugin as opposed to it yeah. spawning new tracks, and yeah. that seemed like a mess. Okay. On a very basic level, how would you define the difference between mixing and mastering? Mixing is taking care of all of the sonic troubleshooting 
and all the heavy processing. Mastering is your final polish. It's very simplistic and minimalistic. And it's just making sure your final output level is your final output level and it's your final notches of EQ to just open up your mix a little more. So would you say that mixing is something that's done basically to work on the quality of individual tracks or mastering is something that happens on the combined master track? Exactly. Okay. Thank you. And thank you very much. That's everything. All right. So now that all the questions from the chat are answered, um, my dog is being very loud. <laughs> now that all the questions from the chat are answered, if you guys have any other questions, um, feel free to go ahead and bring them up. Uh, if I know, Katie, you still have, I think, some issues with your microphone. If you have a question, you can put it in uh, the, the chat and I will read it for you. And otherwise, we can open it up to a general discussion if there's anything that you want to talk about regarding mixing and mastering or sound design that you haven't learned yet or you're brand new to, or it's not really even a question, but something that lets you learn a little bit more, then this is the time to do it. I don't have any general questions, but I'd love to have a focused session where we um, showed live examples of how some of the stuff works, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to like, maybe not like on a, not something as wide in breadth, but more depth, like focused on uh, how you can use EQ to fix certain problems or how to make a monster voice. Uh, something more of a deeper dive, I suppose, at some point. I can always try. Um, again, it's, it's who I can get to help me, who knows how to do that stuff, <laughs> to, to come on and do these things. Um, but okay, so something that's, that's less of the starting at the beginning and more of a middle to high, or today we're gonna go into very specifics, making the making of a 15 second clip and everything that's done on, on something like that. Yeah, so okay. it's not necessarily like, it doesn't need to be like a deep hour long session about everything that is mastering. Mm -hmm. Maybe like one aspect that really troubles people, like um, getting specific audio artifacts out of there that maybe you made it into the recording, but it's otherwise fine. Or when someone is speaking and they're doing this and then doing this and then like, so balancing out the levels for the performance or something like that. Okay. All right. At some point when I finish the, uh, the dialogue, should you be interested, Scooter, um, for Vast, I think like tomorrow at some point, I'm going to probably just do like a, a live stream that goes on while I'm editing episode three, and you'll be able to hear and see what I'm doing at speed for the episode. It's, it's spoilers, but it's, it's like educational. It's intended to be educational for the scene. Like you'll, you'll have an idea of what's happening in the scene because I'm making the sounds for the scene, but that's, that's kind of how that works. Yeah, but I, I think, um, I don't know. Not quite as useful. Something. It's not really the mixing mastering that's, that happens after. Yeah. I normally would be in interested in that. It's just every Thursday we do our stuff. <laughs> it's kind of hard. We're all busy. We get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. Well, if there's nothing else, that's okay too. Um, these things do take like a few hours. So by the time we get to the end, people are usually out of steam, which is totally fine. In which case, thank you guys for coming. And this has been this month's uh, Audio Drama Roundtable, where we learn something new about how to create an audio drama, how to make it better, how to get it out into the world, and everything in between. So I'm Caitlin. If everyone would like to introduce themselves, that will be the, uh, the, the farewell, is saying who you are. Um, so Travis, we'll go ahead and start. Hey, I'm Travis. You've heard me talk for a while. And uh, thank you for having me. Hey, I'm Ryan. Thanks for having me on. It's been really interesting, actually. Uh, it's, it's super helpful. Thank you. I'm glad it could help. Um, and then there's Katie, but Katie can't talk. So that's Katie Seaton, and I'm glad that she was able to make it. I hope that she found it helpful. And then at the bottom, we have Scooter. Scooter? Oh, yeah. I, Scooter Man, I run a bunch of shows. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks. Glad we could have you. And then uh, we had Amon earlier as well, but he had to leave. And then our non-video participant is actually our presenter, who is Sarah. Um, Sarah, do you want to say our farewells? I'm Sarah. I'm from Polarity Audio Works. I engineer on a lot of different shows. And thanks for coming out, everyone. All right. Bye.